Hey, I want to thank you for being a guest here at CalmClass.com. This website is dedicated to one thing, to be able to give you a different mindset. To be able to stay calm in tough times is by changing how you think, because when you change how you think, it changes how you live. My name is Dwight Bain. I'll be your host through most of these lessons, but I'm really glad that you found us. I'm really glad that you're taking time out to watch a lesson that will be life-changing. So do this. Take good notes. Download the study guides. Let these life application principles make your life a better place. And then would you let us know how this is helping you? My thanks to you for watching. My thanks to our incredible team for making it happen. But most of all, my thanks to God because he gives us principles that will change our life if we use them. Are you ready? Let's get started. Sometimes when you don't think that dropping a candy bar on your former enemy would change hearts and make people see America differently, you realize, oh, but I know because my mom had several relatives in the war. Um, they did amazing things. So remember, they did amazing things because there were thousands of people praying for their safety. Just like we pray for the safety of our veterans now in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and, and Syria, the special forces, and who knows where they are. We pray for them, and, and there really is a God, and He really does hear, and He really does watch over us. And so, whether you're watching by technology and streaming live, or you're watching at calmclass.com at some point in the future, let me say thank you for watching, and thank you for those that are here in Orlando because we're going to talk about this subject that is at the core of God's heart. We're going to talk about relationships. But before we talk about God and His Word, let's talk to Him. Father, thank You for these friends, those that are watching because of technology and those that are here. Thank You that Daniel's getting stronger. Thank You, God, that he has a loving mom and dad. And he has a Christian school at the First Academy of teachers and fellow students praying for him. But most of all, God, thank you that we never go through anything alone. Whether somebody's watching from a hospital room, or they're watching maybe, uh, God, who knows where, a prison cell, on a military base somewhere. May each of us be encouraged as we think about, as we think about relationship. God, may you use this lesson to change hearts, but most of all, God, may you use it to change mine. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. They call it the Kennedy Curse, the Kennedy Curse. And there is a reflection when you think about the Kennedy Curse, and I have a list, and I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions here in just a moment. But there is a sense that, and you can read this sometimes even in Scripture, that people think, well, individuals who are wealthy and individuals who are powerful don't have problems. And I can assure you that that is not accurate. People who are wealthy and people who are powerful have problems. They just have different problems. In fact, in the current, in the current governmental system, it seems like that, uh, that the patron saint of this current government is an individual, a fellow named Robin Hood, <laughs> who, who said, oh, what? You have, you know, it's like, it's like the old joke, you know, the, the new IRS simplified tax form. It says, how much did you make? last year, and then there's a place for you to fill in. It's very simple, it's just like, you know, one, one, not even half a sheet of paper. How much did you make last year? There's a little box, a little dollar sign, and then underneath it, it says, send it in. Okay, so that way, <laughs> the solution is real simple. Just do it, you know, just, just give it all to us. Just trust, big brother, I will take care of you. So there's a tendency to think, well, the people that are rich enough to have attorneys and to have CPAs and certified financial planners, they miss all that. So I'm going to give you some data, and then I'm going to ask you a question. The data is actual, it's factual. Uh, I, I won't give you all of the dates, but these are actual events that happen. And what I want you to think about is, because somebody asked me this last week, Dwight, do you believe in generational curses? Do you think that a family can have a spiritual curse on them? I'm going to give you the facts, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Here we go. Uh, Rosemary Kennedy, 1941, uh, was uh, diagnosed with uh, bipolar and schizophrenia. She had to undergo a lobotomy, which affected her, her cognitive abilities. As a result, she had mental illness and was institutionalized until her death in 2005. 
1944, Joe Kennedy Jr. died when his plane exploded. Uh, May uh, 1948, Kathleen, uh, 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 Kathleen, one of the cousins, died in a plane crash in France. August uh, 23, 1956, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy gave birth to a stillborn daughter who was buried at Arlington. Um, and it doesn't even have a name. It just says daughter next to her father's gravesite. November 22, 1963, U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Lee Harvey Oswald was charged with the crime but was shot and killed by Jack Ruby two days later before a trial could take place. The FBI and the Warren Commission quickly concluded that Oswald was the lone assassin. However, since then, the United States House Select Committee on Assassination concluded those investigations were seriously flawed, and the United States government at this point in time has determined that Kennedy was probably assassinated as the result of a mass conspiracy. Uh, June 19, 1964. Ted Kennedy was involved in a plane crash in which one of his uh, staff members and the pilot were killed. 1968, U.S. Senator, this is uh, June 5, Robert F. <coughs> Kennedy was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan in Los Angeles, immediately following his victory in the California Democratic presidential primary. July 18, 1969, Ted Kennedy accidentally drove his car off a bridge on Chappaquiddick Island, which fatally trapped his passenger, Mary Jo Kopechny, inside. In his July 25 televised statement, Kennedy stated on the night of the incident, after it happened, he wondered if there was whether or not there was some awful curse that hung over the Kennedy family. August 1973, Joseph P. Kennedy II was the driver of a car which crashed and injured his passenger, uh, critically injured his passenger, Pam Kelly. November 1973, Ted Kennedy Jr. had his right leg amputated from bone cancer. October 1975, uh, here's Michael who raped uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, again, one of the nephews who raped a neighbor, was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. April 1984, David Kennedy died of cocaine overdose in Palm Beach, Florida. April 1, 1991, William Kennedy Smith was charged with the rape of a young woman on the Kennedy estate in Palm Beach. Uh, December 31, 1997, Michael Kennedy died in a skiing accident in Aspen, Colorado. He was currently under investigation, uh, suspected of statutory rape after having a three-year-long affair with the 14-year-old babysitter. July uh, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. died when the uh, light aircraft he was piloting crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Due to his pilot error, uh, his wife and sister-in-law were also killed in the plane accident. September 2001, Kara Kennedy Allen died of a heart attack while exercising in Washington, D.C. at a health club. May 16, 2002, Mary Kennedy hung herself on the grounds of her home in Bedford County, New York, and of course it goes on. So here's the question. At your tables, because here in Orlando, to those watching by technology, we're sitting at round tables. All right, so you've heard the data of dozens and dozens of occurrences over the last few decades. At your table, take a minute or two. If you don't know the people at your table, please introduce yourself with your name. Uh, I'll do that with the people watching online. Hi, my name is Dwight, and we're going to talk about the Kennedy curse. But at your table, introduce your name. Don't say, hi, my name is Dwight, Tim. That would not be that really humorous at this point. Good singing. Uh, but introduce your name, and then just give your thoughts. Do you think there's a curse on this family? Do you think that some wealthy, powerful families have a curse? Go. Hi, this is Dwight Payne. I do not have a cold. I'm whispering so that you get the audio signal. Do you think that there's a curse? If you're watching the live presentation, you're actually going to be able to, uh, to type in. There's a little box where you can type in your thoughts. Do you think there's a Kennedy curse? Do you think there's a Kennedy curse? Do you think that all of those things happened because there was a curse? And, and I'll tell you some of the background history on that is that there were individuals who said this family who have unbelievable amounts of money, unbelievable amounts of power, unbelievable amounts of influence, that with that, because of uh, in the prohibition, which was a period of time in the 1920s where the United States government said you could not legally buy alcohol. And allegedly, that because of the prohibition, the Kennedy family, uh, that's where they generated their extreme wealth. Some people have said because they made their money selling alcohol, that there would be a curse on their family forever. There's no question that that particular family has endured a tremendous amount of suffering and a tremendous amount of pain. But what do you think? 
I'd love to hear your feedback. So again, if you're watching it live on the live stream, uh, then just type into the text box and tell me your thoughts. I'll take a moment while you're typing in. To those who are watching at calmclass.com, let me tell you that, and you'll hear this again in a moment as we hear the input from our class, that uh, there are a lot of things that happen in families. And the goal of our message is about broken relationships. And one of the interesting things about the Kennedy clan is that no matter how bad it seemed it got, they did seem to stick together. So if your family's going through a particularly tough time, do you guys go through it together? There's a prison uh, sentence. Do you go visit? As we heard our pastor talk about this morning, if, if, if somebody's in the hospital because of something horrible that happened, a plane accident, do you go see them? You see, sometimes the greatest test of a relationship is what happens in a crisis. Let's go back to the live audience here in Orlando and we'll talk about it. Good point. And remember, it's one of the things I love about that particular scripture. It does say generational curse. If, they, if the parents and grandparents do this, the children of three and four generations. But right before that it says, the righteous are blessed for 1,000 generations. All right, so, I mean, it's not, oh, my goodness gracious, my grandparents were terrible. It's because of Jesus, because that's old school, because of Jesus, we don't have to live under the law. However, what if somebody ignores Christ? Well, now, all of a sudden, old school works. They're still under the curse. They're still under the curse. Yeah. What other thoughts did you have? Yeah, in the back, Tim. Well, that's pretty powerful. And he wasn't called a man after God's own heart. Talking about a royal family, he really was a royal family where there was, I mean, just horrible, horrible things they did to each other. Uh, I mean, rape, murder, uh, adultery, secrets, cover-up, but all of that, uh, I'll just call it garbage, it, it drove them, or at least it drove David, it, tragically it didn't drive the rest of his family with the exception of his one son Solomon, it drove the rest of his family deeper to God. Yesterday, my son and I uh, took a shortcut trying to get to Ikea from downtown. And as we went through a particular neighborhood uh, down Paramore Street, he said, Dad, this doesn't look like a real safe neighborhood. I said, well, son, you know, note to self, um, here's what's in this neighborhood. Some very evil people, and the majority of them are very wounded people. And they wouldn't hurt you. They would happily take your money. But, but they wouldn't hurt you because they're just wounded. And, and uh, we had a wonderful conversation because I said, uh, as once we got you know, over toward the Mall of Millenia area, the, you know, kind of the, it, it, the neighborhood changes a bit. And I said, so son, what was the biggest takeaway from that experience? He said, it seemed like that there was a church on every corner. Why is that? I said, because people who are deeply wounded, whether it be from their addictions or the abuse they've endured, they know they need God. They know they need God, but, 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 but they go to church, and, and because of a lot of other factors, sometimes they don't stay with God. They go back to how they grew up. Listen, there are curses that come to those who say, I'm going to do it my own way, and I don't need you. Some people might call that, well, no, that's just logical consequences. Well, I'm going to give you some information about broken relationships, because actually, if you're watching at calmclass.com, I'm glad you're watching, I'm always glad that you're with us, but we're coming into the holiday season, and a lot of people are going to have to sit at Thanksgiving dinner with some people, and I'm going to give them some tips. Marty, did you have a thought? Well, I've been to the, uh, Marty's talking about the, uh, the Kennedy assassination, I've been to the Texas School Book Depository, I spent a day there, and I've talked to a number of other people who were in Dallas at the time, and doing some research, um, several of them working for some, uh, some very wealthy individuals. <laughs> who would completely disagree with that because um, their employers paid for Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, wife for the rest of her life. Uh, several of them had met with Oswald two or three days ahead of time. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. But if we just look at just the Kennedy assassination, it's a bad day for the Kennedy family. But if we look at a few decades, it's a few bad decades. I mean, when you think about your own family, how many of your family have been assassinated? How many of your own family have, have had mysterious circumstances with young women who allegedly were pregnant and, and, and who was just being given a lift from a party and ended up dead uh, in a car off a bridge? How many 
people in your family have had plane crashes? How many people in your family have had plane crashes where they caused the problem and killed their own wife and sister-in-law? So when you start to look at it, it's like, well, they had a real string of bad luck. But really what I want you to see, the one takeaway from that in the research of talking to people uh, who, uh, and, and, and because of uh, what I did working with, with uh, Liberty University, I had access to Ted Kennedy on multiple occasions. He would not talk about either of his brothers, um, but he would talk about a lot of things. And Senator Kennedy was an interesting individual, to say the least. But in doing that, the one takeaway that I always had with the Kennedys, and my mom helped me to see it, whether somebody was facing a prison term for rape of a staff member, whether somebody, here's another funeral, here's another funeral, here's another drug-induced funeral, here's another drug-induced funeral, here's a suicide, here's a suicide. The one takeaway, they would always stand together. Isn't that interesting? So you talk about problems. I mean, you thought you had problems. How many of your kids have committed suicide? You, you thought you had problems. How many times have you had federal investigators show up at your house? Uh, but... Do you have people to stand with you? Because that family stood together. The family that we're going to look at in a few minutes, the royal family of Scripture, they didn't stand together at all. I mean, they represent, they represent this. This, by the way, is called the boyfriend pillow. <laughs> Got this for my daughter so that when she would, so that when she went to Old Miss, she didn't have to find a new boyfriend. She could just cuddle up and and her boyfriend here in Orlando would be waiting and remembering. The interesting thing is the boyfriend pillow got left in Orlando when she headed off to Oxford, Mississippi. Mike, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, you guys have had kids go off to college. What is it when they leave the boyfriend pillow? Is that, is that like a sign, Tim? I mean, you've gone through this. Is it like maybe I, I don't have room to pack this? Or is it maybe a representation of other things? I, I don't I know. I one of those for my girls. <laughs> Well, I'm using this not as the boyfriend pillow because I'm, I, I, I actually, you know, I'm pretty happy with the boyfriend I have and all of the friends that I have. This is representative of what if you have half a relationship? What if you only have half of a relationship? You see, the Kennedy clan in the worst of times came together. Jackie O, even when she had remarried and gone on with her life, the Kennedy clan still hung with her. Isn't that interesting? You say, oh, I disagree with them about a lot of stuff. They stuck together. How does your family do when there's a suicide? How does your family deal with it when somebody's in alcohol or drug rehab? Does everybody show up? Do they support each other? Or do you have half a relationship? Now, as I said, we're recording this around the holiday season in uh, North America here in the United States other parts of the world where you're watching calmclass.com, uh, just to explain the tradition to you, there is a holiday called Thanksgiving. It was basically kind of built around the concept of uh, uh, something that you can still practice on the streets of all major cities in the United States today, and that is somebody who's not of your nationality offering you food that is called meat, and you're not sure what it is, but you're supposed to eat it. <laughs> because the early pilgrims, they didn't even know how to function or survive. Over half of them had died because of illness. They came to America looking for God, and some Native Americans took pity on them. And they met together in a large feast and celebrated the fact of one thing. We are thankful we're alive. We're thankful we can worship. Wow, that's pretty powerful. David, do you have a question? Yeah, no, well, it does illustrate the point that the tradition we call Thanksgiving... People, there's no question, they eat too much. There's no question, they drink too much. There's no question, they spend too much. Of course, domestic violence goes up, but so does suicide. And so over the holidays, people go into serious debt. They'll gain about six pounds. It's about a pound a week from Thanksgiving to New Year's. That's a lot of calories. It's a lot of calories, but I think that, you know, why would people do that? I'll tell you, I think the biggest reason right here. I think that because of Thanksgiving, because there's not a lot to do that's about to change, but because the traditional Thanksgiving is I have to sit at the table with some people I may not like, some people at the table who maybe cheated my family, some people at the table who have been particularly unkind. I have to sit at the table with some people that there's a broken relationship, and there is a solution. 
to be able to say, Uncle Frank, you drink too much. <laughs> hey, you know what? Sarah, the things that you say to my wife hurt her feelings, and that's inappropriate. And we're not going to sit at the table if you're going to be rude and disrespectful. To be able to speak the truth in love, as Scripture teaches, that's how you build real relationship. But a lot of people at Thanksgiving, they're unwilling to do that, but they're certainly willing to say, yeah, give me another one. Because on the way to Thanksgiving, they're having long conversations over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go about the dysfunction. And I swear, if, 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 if he says that again, we're getting up and leaving. Don't you dare. Don't you dare hurt my mom's feelings. Don't you dare say that. And then they get there, and we're all in our places with bright, smiling faces. <laughs> And then when somebody says at the table, sitting across the table from someone that they know, and I've had this happen, David, sitting at the table with somebody that they know has been abusive with their spouse, and I'm told I'm not supposed to say something, I'm not related to them. I don't have skin in the game. But because I'm connected through marriage, I'm told I have to play nice. And that blew up a few years ago, and now Thanksgiving is a much healthier experience. It's a lot smaller group of people, too. <laughs> I'm not saying be rude, but I am saying speak truth. Because the only way you can go from half relationship to whole relationship is to show up and speak the truth. Listen, I want you to know, everybody has broken relationships. By the way, wealthy, powerful, influential families like the Kennedys... They get better news media attention than you or I. There are people right here in this room that have family members who have drug problems or who've been in rehab. People right here in this room, I know people that are watching that have family members in prison. People right here in this room, you've gone through broken relationships. You've had a son or daughter act out. You've gone through maybe a, a, a divorce or adultery or some big secret. But the difference is you don't have paparazzi who sell newspapers and make money off of reporting your family's pain. Because it's been my experience, if you reject God, there will be much hardship in your life. If you embrace God, there will be hardship, comma, with hope. Because the hope is we'll get through this. And one of the greatest hopes is we'll get through this as a family. We're not in this alone. Let's take a look in your study guide and I'll show you what I mean. Because when we talk about how do we restore broken relationship, Oswald Chambers, Oswald said our human relationships or the actual conditions in which the ideal life of God is to be exhibited. So here's the first question. Are you rich in relationships or are you rich in things? Are you rich in relationships? I mean, if all your things were taken away because the changes in the tax code, would you still be rich in relationship? If you have a family member in the hospital, if, you, if your house is being foreclosed on and you need somebody to help show up with a U-Haul, and a couple of hand trucks. Do you have people you could call? Are you rich in relationships? And what we're seeing is that there's a significant number of people, particularly those that are older or retired, they're rich in things. They just don't have anybody to share it with. And, and the sad reality is that their funeral people do show up with a U-Haul. Mm -hmm. I've been to some funerals like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and I knew the person. And I'll say, uh, hi, my name is Dwight. Always an appropriate thing. Introduce yourself. Don't assume that people know who you are. Hi, my name is Dwight. And, and, and you are? And they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm so-and-so. I was his brother. Really? Um, do, are you from out of town? No, no, we live in Pine Castle. Um, did you go to a different church? No, we just hadn't talked in 30 years. And for people who have a lot of affluence, I can assure you why, why the brother from Pine Castle is showing up. It's not to show great respect. Usually, it's, it's, it's usually about other reasons, other motivations, right? Yes. That's the thing I appreciate about the Kennedys or some of the families like that. No matter how ugly or bad, they did stick together. Does your family do that? Are you rich in relationships or are you rich in things? Is anything more important than relationships? Is anything more important than relationships? I think the answer is no. Here's the basic principle. Our lives are shaped by those who love us and those who refuse to love us. Our lives are shaped by those who love us and those who refuse to love us. 
And then would you write down the name Dr. John Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N? Gottman has some really interesting research out in California. He's a, 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 a Mears family therapist, a clinical psychologist, a teacher. And Gottman has found a ratio of five to one that in relationships, and he's done research with thousands of couples, he can meet a couple for the very first time. Within two minutes, he can predict with over 90% accuracy if they'll still be married in five years. Two minutes. Two minutes. Because he has learned over 200 different variables to watch, to see, and the greatest of these, uh, it's 205 actually variables, and the greatest of these he's paying attention to are these people kind to each other. Gottman, a Jewish researcher, but he certainly would practice what you and I would call the fruits of the Spirit. Are they kind to each other? Are they patient with each other? You can determine contempt in, in, in a split second, just in a facial change. That's how he can do it in minutes. So how can you in a couple of minutes determine if somebody is still <laughs> going to be married a decade later? Well, Gottman says there's a ratio, and it should be five to one. Five to one positives. For one, I can't believe you said that. Now again, let's go back to a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner or a New Year's dinner celebration. Haven't you been sitting there and heard people who were related to each other or connected to each other by marriage being particularly unkind to each other? And what they're telling you in big, bold, flashing letters is this relationship is more broken than you think, but we're playing nice because Grandma is here. Now, as I said, this year... Thank God there's relief. The, the people, and, and I say this only for the people in North America, specifically the United States, the nice people at the Kmart Corporation have decided to open their Black Friday sale at 6 a.m. Thanksgiving Day. So at 6 a.m. now, you have a choice. You do not have to go over the river and through the woods to Grandma's house. You can go elbow somebody in the face to get a $2 toaster. <laughs> 6 a.m. Thanksgiving Day, because Macy's, Target, Walmart, J.C. Penney are opening at 8 p.m. Thanksgiving Day. It's probably the end of the motion picture industry as we know it, because normally on Thanksgiving Day, you're getting, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're watching the Dallas Cowboys lose to whoever they're going to lose to that year. And... Oh, it's the Lions. It's the Lions. Oh. Yeah, you're a lion if you think the Cowboys are ever going to win. No. You watch the Dallas Cowboys lose, and then you sit around and you talk to each other, and you play board games or puzzles or whatever you do. And now, if people have the choice to choose between greed and grandma, I can tell you who's going to win that. Greed, you betcha. And so the retailers now, and I'm, and I'm, I'm really sad about it because Thanksgiving was the one holiday that was only about faith because Christmas kind of gets lost with Frosty and Rudolph and, 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 the, and the little drummer boy and all those things that you really have to, to stretch to find in Scripture. It's like, okay, Jesus had an island of lost toys. Tell me again. How did that work? Misfit toys, sorry. Misfit toys. But when you look at Thanksgiving, it's about being thankful to God and being with family. But we live in a culture where there are more people in broken families than traditional families. And so I can promise you, good move Kmart. Because if people have a choice to say, well, we're going to get our Christmas shopping done early, that they will happily choose greed over grandma. Because many of them didn't want to see grandma anyway. I want to give you some, some, some dynamics to be able to understand about different levels of relationship. But remember... Remember, our lives are shaped by those who love us and those who refuse to love us. So think about who you have a broken relationship with. Your marriage partner, your neighbor, your family members, your co-workers, your friends, your boss, people from your past. You have a broken relationship with God. And it's interesting to me, David Youth taught me this, why are there no father-in-law jokes? I mean, Tim, you're a speaker, a communicator. No father-in-law jokes, but I did find this bumper sticker. It says, uh, warrant caution, in case of rapture, this car will swerve as my mother-in-law takes the wheel. So in case of the rapture... <laughs> I found this in a Christian bookstore, Alicia. I, just, I thought there was a message there. I thought, yeah, when, you put, when you're willing to put this on your car... <laughs> Dan, the 
it's got it so when you're willing to put this on your car you're making a statement I'm not even sure psychologically what that statement is there are no father-in-law jokes I just don't even understand that so when we take a look at this who do you have a broken relationship with you can always tell your real friends when you've made a fool of yourself they don't think you did a permanent job why do relationships break up dozens of reasons selfishness just circle I want you to think about any key relationship in your life and then circle the pieces. Was it, did it break up because of selfishness, jealousy, unrealistic expectations, indifference, pride, insults, disappointment, power, control, manipulation, distance, separation, overcommitment, dishonest, materialism. That means money or things are more important than you. Wrong priorities, disrespect, hidden areas or secrets, loss of trust, sarcasm, angry episodes, physically abusive, ignoring or avoiding their actual needs. Uh, and, and enabling or entitlement behaviors, greed, and would you add in lying? Would you add in misunderstandings? Why do relationships break up? Stu Weber, one of the founders of the Christian men's movement, said the relationship is more important than the issue. But the bottom line, okay, write it down, hurt people slash hurt people. If they're selfish and greedy, if they were rude to one of your kids, why did the relationship break up? There was something inside of them. Remember, liars lie and cheaters cheat. And people who are full of grace and wisdom give out grace and wisdom. So take a look at this. Do you ever wonder why you feel pressured from some people? They have hidden agendas. They have hidden agendas, which will leave you feeling manipulated. Which will leave you feeling manipulated. And when you feel manipulated from hidden agendas, <clears throat> excuse me, here's the prayer I want you to pray. I shared this with Brother Jim on August 28th, 1998. He liked it, wrote a note back, and I kept it. This is the senility prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, grant me the senility to forget the people I never liked anyway. The good fortune to run into the ones I do and the good eyesight to tell the difference. Amen. So the senility prayer. God, just let me be senile enough to not even remember how rude or hateful those people are. Teddy Roosevelt said the most important, watch this, the most important single ingredient of success is knowing how to get along with people. And that is more true today, particularly, particularly for those that are college age or entering the job market because so many, so many college age people, so many young people... They are excellent at technology. They're just not good at relationship. They're not good at people. And so here's what's happening. And it is a massive gap between the haves and the have-nots. There's some kids that are amazing on the computer, but when they have to go to a job interview, they forget Teddy Roosevelt's advice. The single most important ingredient is getting along with people. They have no social skills. They have internet technology skills. They have texting skills. They don't have people skills. People skills equal jobs. Technology skills, texting skills equal my Facebook profile looks better than yours. But social skills, relationship skills. As we take a look at this, my friend Les Parrot has 14 different type of serious relationship problems. Les calls them high maintenance relationships. Here we go. The critic. When you think about the person you have a broken relationship with, are they a critic? A critic is constantly complaining. They give unwanted advice. Well, if I were you, <laughs> the martyr, forever the victim, and racked with self-pity. Okay, so, so here's how the martyr works. All right, so, so raise, raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. All right. Put your right hand on your forehead. Here's how the martyr works. And then just, just make the sound. Oh. <laughs> Like a dying calf in a hell store, right? <laughs> so when you see this person at Thanksgiving, you know, like Pastor Youth was saying, you know, people that drain you. <laughs> when you see this person just, just, just stepping out of their, you know, Ford F one fifty pickup, oh, you just, you know, you run and and you volunteer. You never offer to help in the kitchen. But when you see them coming, it's like, do you have trash I can take out? Can I take things to recyclable in Minnesota? I mean, you know, can I find some way? Yeah, yeah. Do you need ice? Oh, good one, Patrick. Do you need ice? I'll volunteer. I'll go to a convenience store. I, I, I'll go to a convenience store down in Palm Beach Park. I mean, I will get the ice for the family. How can I get away from you? The martyr. Oh. You stand next to them, they just suck the oxygen out of the room. The wet blanket.
blanket pessimistic and automatically <laughs> negative. But when you're around a pessimist, I mean, listen to this. This is a guy, senior citizen right here in Orlando. After being married to my wife for 44 years, I took a careful look at her one day and said, Honey, 44 years ago, we had a cheap apartment, a cheap car, slept on a sofa bed and watched a 10-inch black and white TV, but I got to sleep every night with a hot, hard body 25-year-old gal. Now I have a $2 million home, I have a $75,000 car, a nice big bed, and a jumbo flat screen TV, but I'm sleeping with a 65-year-old woman. It seems to me that you're not holding up your side of things. <laughs> he said, my wife is a very reasonable woman, Dwight. She told me that if I go out and find a hot, hard-bodied 25-year-old gal, she would make sure that I would be once again living in a cheap apartment, driving a cheap car, sitting on a sofa bed, and watching a 10-inch black and white TV. He said, Dwight, it was amazing. He said, older women can solve a midlife crisis that fast. It's incredible. It's a gift. The wet blanket. It's like, oh, you think you want to? Let me help you with that. The wet blanket. They're pessimists. The steamroller, blindly insensitive to others. The bad thing about the steamroller is they're rolling over other people. Everybody else knows they're a bully except for them. The gossip spreads rumors, leaks secrets. The control freak unable to let go and let be. Now, the passive control freak is the Mr. Fix-It. The active control freak is a Hitler. The control freak. They just have to dominate and control your life. And one of the reasons I talked to a young person not long ago, as a young person, you know I'm getting older when somebody who's 30 is young to me. <laughs> and she said, to wait the happiest time, she said, for almost seven years, I volunteered to help feed the homeless on Thanksgiving Day, and I didn't have to deal with my mother. She said, I got out of college, and I went to a particular college because I knew that she wouldn't be able to get there. It was kind of remote. And she said, when I came back to the Orlando area, I immediately volunteered with whatever ministry needed somebody on Thanksgiving, so I didn't have to deal with her because she controls my life. Now, there's another solution to that. Yay, that the homeless got some help. The other solution is to say, Mother, you control my life. I'm actually a full-grown adult now. You educated and equipped me to live a good life, and so please... Thank you for your opinion. Stand down. I'm not mad at you. I'm just going to tell you the truth, right? If we take a look at this, the next one after we leave the control freak is to look at the backstabber. The backstabber is two-faced. The cold shoulder, they disengage and avoid conflict. The cold shoulder. The green-eyed monster, seething with envy. These people are funny at family gatherings because they always show up with a new car or a new computer or a new some kind of toy or new jewelry, something just to say I'm better than you. Uh, that's the, the envy people. The volcano, they build steam, they're ever ready to erupt. The sponge, constantly in need, but they give nothing back. Constantly in need, but they give nothing back. The competitor, keep score on emotions, keep score on uh, uh, material things. Okay, and I'll tell you where you used to see this, not so much anymore, but was Christmas letters. Because people would send out their Christmas letter of how they have been on the most fabulous vacations this year. OMG. Uh, you know, those three weeks in the Mediterranean, on the private yacht, you know, with, with the Trump family or whoever. I mean, we're just, you know, and it was just, and then, and then the kids, oh, they are all, you know, above average intelligence and just gorgeous and, and, and dating fa famous, fabulous people. In fact, my daughter just the other day was saying as she was hanging out with Spike Lee and some of those film producers at her new job where she makes 200 zillion dollars more than your children. And have you ever noticed that some of those Christmas letters are like, oh my God, these people... And then we don't see Christmas letters as much because now there's Facebook. And they can do the same thing on Facebook and then save the stamp, right? Post office not as reliable as they used to be. The workhorse. Workhorse is always pushing, never satisfied. The flirt. The flirt, unsolicited comments and invasion of boundaries. And the thing about the flirt is these people sometimes have real lust issues and they just say really inappropriate things around young people. All right, the chameleon, eager to please but avoiding conflict. So Les has, this is from a book Les wrote called High Maintenance Relationships. So would you take a minute and just answer some questions? So these are the broken ones, but what about you? Who do you love as defined by your actions? Do you love your family as defined by your actions? Some people love their cat more than they love their family if you just looked at their behavior. Who loves you as defined by their actions? Who loves you as defined 
by their actions. Who do you take for granted? Who do you take for granted? Who would you miss if they died? Who would you really miss? Who would miss you? Just put in a name. Who's unforgettable? Who would you rather avoid? Who do you have a broken relationship with? Who has a broken relationship with you? One of the things, this is from uh, Jim Rohn, uh, a wonderful business coach. One caring person caring about another represents life's greatest value. Jim said, your family and your love must be cultivated like a garden. Time, effort, imagination must be summoned constantly to keep any relationship flourishing and growing. Jim said, if you talk to your children, you can help them keep their lives together. If you talk to them skillfully, skillfully talking to your children helps them build their future dreams. Isn't that powerful? So when we think about relationships, who do you have a relationship with? Who do you have a broken relationship with? The royal family of Scripture, by the way, Joseph's family. The great-grandson of Abraham, he had 12 siblings, 11 brothers, one sister. They're the royal family of Scripture. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then these 12 brothers, one daughter. They're the royal family of Scripture. You will not find, as you read through Genesis, starting in Genesis 37, you will not find more hatred, envy, jealousy, murder, rape, secret affairs, um, I mean, relationship with daughter-in-law where she gets pregnant. You will not find more baggage. The one thing you will not find in the royal family in Scripture, similar to the royal family that we talked about earlier, no plane crashes. I could not, Patrick, I, I searched the Scripture, I could not find one single plane crash in Abraham's genealogy. So apparently they were good on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Yeah, you just have to look. You have to look into the original Hebrew. I mean, the idea of, you know, a, a, a girl who, who gets knocked up who's not, it's there. This family has some problems, and one of the problems, one of the problems is about a guy named Joseph. He is, because Jacob had uh, four women in his life, two wives, one that he loved and treasured and worshipped and adored, and one that he completely took for granted. And he had two mistresses, and between them, 13 children. Wow. You thought you had a big blended family for, for you know Thanksgiving coming. And Joseph's brothers hated him so much because when Joseph's mom died, the dad, instead of dealing with his grief, just poured everything into one child. Major sibling rivalry. And the brothers, get this, all completely agreed we're going to murder him. And we're going to hide his body. And we're going to lie to our dad. And they were all, they were all totally on board with it. And the weirdest thing happens. Their greed was greater than their need to punish Joseph. So they sold him to the slave traders. They sold him as a slave. And you thought your brothers were not very nice to you by giving you a wedgie or, or noogies or whatever. <laughs> Joseph's brothers beat him up, threw him in a pit, and then sold him to the slave traders. So here's some things we know about Joseph. Quick overview. Listen. And listen for broken relationship. He had lost his mother... He was the sole protector of his little brother. He was greatly disliked by his ten half-brothers, three stepmothers. His dad overcompensated and played favorites. Lots of family secrets in this huge blended family. Lots of family secrets. His dad overcompensated. Really, and his dad was part of the problem. Blended families often have major confusion of roles and major confusion of rules. Remember, Josh McDowell said, rules without relationship equal rebellion. But watch this. I'll take off on what Josh said. Relationship without rules equals entitlement. And Joseph was entitled. He was spoiled. So we take a look at this. He had learned about God from his father, not from religion, because it hadn't been invented yet. The law of God wasn't written down by Moses for over 500 years. He was a great dreamer. But the weird thing about Joseph is he was a doer. No matter, once he had that horrible episode of his brother selling him out, everything else he did, he gets sold into Potiphar's household as just a house slave. And it's not too long, literally just a few months, 
and he is in charge of all of the other slaves. It's like every time you knock Joseph down, he bounces back higher. The boss's wife, remember back then he was a slave, he was property. The boss's wife said, I believe that I shall have you as my flavor of the day, my boy toy. And he says, no, absolutely not. There's nobody that was there. It was legal in that day and age for her to do that. There was no sexual harassment. It was legal for her to do that, to say, I shall. And he said, no. And she said, how dare you? How dare you? And she accused him of rape. He goes to prison on a sexual harassment, a rape charge. And in prison, it's only a few weeks until he's running the entire prison. Because God was getting him ready to run things in Potiphar's house. And then God was getting him ready to run bigger governmental things in the prison. And then he runs all of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. Joseph always, every time he got knocked down, he wasn't just a dreamer, he was a doer. No one understood the big picture, not even Joseph. Joseph didn't even understand it until he was an old man. Life marched on in spite of the pain of the loss, in spite of the loss of his family. Remember, he did like his brothers, although they didn't like him. Life marched on. In spite of falsely being held in prison, life marched on. And Joseph marched on with it. Do you see the key? He kept moving forward. How did he do that? He wasn't looking to this. I miss my family. I miss my daddy. My mama died. He was looking to this. I have not lost you, oh God. As we take a look at this, he had a big heart for others with a tremendous attitude. I mean, we see nowhere in Scripture that he's criticizing, complaining, backbiting, whining, martyr. He could have. Not one time. Joe was flexible. He made friends easily. Instead of telling them how bad his life was, he just took care of whatever was going on. Joseph's new life was a demonstration of making the choice to go on, to keep living no matter what. My friend Gary Rosberg says, guard your heart for out of it will flow your life story. Okay, so from Genesis 37... Until what we're going to read now from Genesis 50, I want you to understand, listen to me, it's 37 years. 37 Thanksgivings, 37 Christmases, or in that case, Hanukkah, 37 birthdays, 37 years later. Listen to how long some people carry baggage. This is at their daddy's funeral. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. Remember, it's 37 years later. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. Um, And now please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the God of your father. There is no record that Jacob actually said that. As near as we can tell, they've lived their lives as liars. They made it up. There's no record that Jacob ever said that because Jacob very likely would have said before he died, hey, because Jacob had a really close relationship. Remember, Joe was the favorite. And, and, and parents frequently have relationships and conversations with their favorite child. And some parents play favorites. Jacob did. He certainly would have discussed it because Joseph was his favorite. So here they are. They made up the story to try to save their life. Circle it. Joseph wept. And they spoke to him. His brothers came and they fell down before him and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Remember that was the prophecy he had when he was 17 years old. And now he's a senior citizen. Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not fear. What a message. Don't fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. Circle it, draw an arrow to it. See where it says, But God? But God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Here we go again, second time. So do not fear, I will provide for you, and I will provide for your little ones. Thus he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. And not only spoke kindly to them, he restored them. And when I said, but God, you can look at Joseph's life and you can see it's, it's really painful, it's terrible, but God redeemed him from Potiphar's house. Oh my gosh, she accused him of this, she tried to sexually assault him, but God pulled him into a prison. In the prison he got, rises to leadership, here's the butler, here's the baker, but God let him be with just the right people because he didn't go to any prison, he went to the royal prison because everybody knew it was a trumped up charge. 
but God kept restoring, and God will do that for you. Amen. The relationship to hold on to is this one. Amen. Not the fact that somebody hurt your feelings. It was 37 years before there would be forgiveness. Listen to what Corrie Ten Boom, after a Nazi concentration camp, claimed her mom, her dad, and her sister. She said, I discovered it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but it is on God's. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us along with the command, he gives us the love itself. So you have to make a choice today. You have to make a choice today. You have to make a choice with the people who hurt you. Am I going to forgive them? Am I going to keep holding on to the hurt? Am I going to move forward? Or am I going to keep holding on to the pain? I'm reading a book we're using for our staff devotion, simply called Bonhoeffer by Eric Metasis. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor, a very committed biblical Lutheran pastor in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. He was arrested. If you haven't read the book, please do. I'd always heard his name. I never understood his story. Get this. I'll give you the short version, but it's still worth the read. He spent almost a decade begging other pastors, other strong believers in faith, individuals in the Anglican Church, the American Church. He spent years saying, this Hitler guy is bad news. Remember, in the 1920s, Hitler's generating economic growth. And Hitler was very effective at going to young people and telling them what they wanted to hear. You're the greatest race. You're the greatest nation. Because they just come out of a world war. And Bonhoeffer said, you've got to deal with this Hitler guy. This is bad news. And he begs and pleads with religious leaders who told him, you need to get out of here. Then there was a point where if you were a biblical believing Christian, not just Jews went to work camps, quote unquote, they were death camps. Not just Jews, biblical believers also went to the death camps. And Bonhoeffer was one. He was arrested for a plot in which he did indeed confess to be part of the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Because he said, as a pastor, nobody's going to do anything. Well, by God, I will. <clears throat> he said, I'll be, you know, we've got to take this guy out. <coughs> Talk about civil disobedience. He dies in prison two weeks before the war ends. And his writings are meaningful. In fact, from the book, because don't we live in a time where it's very possible that biblical Christians, did you see what the Senate passed this week? Mm -hmm. That biblical Christians, it's going to cost us something? Here's what Bonhoeffer said. This is a week before, before he was publicly executed by hanging. If God was willing to go to the cross and endure such pain and absorb such a cost in order to save us, listen, then we must live sacrificially as we serve others. Anyone who truly understands how God's grace comes to us will have a changed life. If you truly understand how God's grace comes, you will have a changed life. That's the gospel. It's not salvation by law or cheap grace, but it's costly grace. Costly grace changes you from the inside out. The law and cheap grace cannot do that. And then he goes on. He didn't know it would be his last speech. He didn't know it would be the last time that he shared with some other prisoners a Bible study. He didn't know that because through a series of events, they all knew the war was coming to an end and he thought he might survive it. His father was the most famous psychiatrist in Germany. And yet here's Bonhoeffer who said, who could have stayed in the United States, could have stayed in Britain, and said, oh no, 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 no. I have to go back to my country. I have to go back to my homeland because I have to go back because I've got a greater relationship so that I can share with other people who have a broken relationship. The answer is not in our government. The answer is not in Adolf Hitler. For years he's preaching this. The answer is in God. We have a broken relationship with God, and it's not keeping rules, and it's not signing a card. It's saying, you died for me? You died for me? I was speaking to a group this week in Tampa, a group of business people, and I said, you want the, the solution for temptation? 
to where you never feel that temptation, you never cave to that temptation again, simple. Focus on the cross. Because when you focus on what He did for you, and you see that grace, all of a sudden that pack of cigarettes doesn't look as appealing. The pornography doesn't look as appealing. The six-pack doesn't look as appealing. Being critical and gossiping doesn't look as appealing because you can see, I don't want all the things of this world. I want you. That was Bonhoeffer's Bible study. And then he was hung because he said, I'm not going to bend on this. The only thing that matters is Jesus and sharing Jesus with other people. I love what Pastor David, our pastor to those watching at calmclass.com, our pastor challenged us that on Thanksgiving Day, instead of watching parades or football games, to watch the Billy Graham special, Billy Graham's 30 minutes, his last message on his 95th birthday. If you follow me on social media, I don't have one of the cards, but, but on, on, on like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all that, I posted the link this morning during the message. You can just, just, just go to my Twitter account, at Dwight Bain or, or, or LinkedIn or Facebook. And you click on that. And wouldn't that be powerful? On Thanksgiving, instead of watching a parade or watching a football game, of saying, let's watch Dr. Billy Graham's final message on this day of thanks so then we can talk about it. Wouldn't that be the best Thanksgiving? Wouldn't that be better than a $2 toaster? <laughs> wouldn't that be better than being full of resentment or frustration that you have to sit and eat at the, people, eat at the table with people you don't like? Wouldn't that be just like Jesus? That's how relationship works. He died so that we could be restored. So that we could be, we never have to be a half person again. We could be a whole person because of Jesus. Let's thank him. Father, thank you for these friends, those that are watching by technology. They may be watching. My body may have already failed. But my spirit, my soul will live on, God. Help each of us, whether it be on Thanksgiving Day or any day, to focus on restored relationship, and that starts with Jesus. And God, once we have that, may we never be silent, even if it cost us. May we never be silent to help other people see. This is why I do what I do. It's because of Him. And we pray in our Savior's holy name. Amen. Grace and peace to you. Hi, Dwight Bain here, and I want to tell you about CalmClass.com. The website that you came to is actually a teaching lesson that we record in Orlando, Florida, every single week. You can actually come be part of the live audience. If you're in Florida, maybe you're visiting the Orlando area, come check us out. We meet at 3000 South John Young Parkway. It's on the campus of First Baptist Orlando, which is actually a pretty large place. So what you're looking for is a large building by a lake. It's a big three-story building called Faith Hall. And we're in Faith Hall upstairs in room 301. But if you don't get a chance to come live to the presentation in Orlando, then if these lessons about making your life work better, to get past frustration in relationships, maybe frustrations on the job, maybe you're just kind of feeling beat up about what you believe. If you enjoy these lessons, would you do me a favor? Would you tell a friend? Because by your experience of telling other people, hey, this website helped me, these lessons helped me, when you're doing that, you're helping take the message that we teach in Orlando and to be able to spread that to the entire world. And thanks.